Okay, this is our uh, final talk. Uh, uh, I have a, gr a rare pleasure and privilege to uh, announce Jonathan Beller. Uh, it is his fourth or fifth time here. Yeah, I'm not sure. Beer. I couldn't figure it out. I drank too much beer last night. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, so, Jonathan Beller is one of the foremost theorists of the visual turn and the attention economy. He works on the history of cinema and the way in which the screen image has altered all aspects of social life. These alterations range from the uh, lived experience of gender, sexuality and race to the socio-economic reorganization of people's governments and the environment. His research and pedagogy is undertaken with a commitment to those struggling for social justice in what he calls the world media system. Books and edited volumes include The Cinematic Mode of Production, Attention Economy and the Society of the Spectacle, Acquiring Eyes, Philippine Visuality, National Struggle and the World Media System, and Feminist Media Theory, a special issue of the Scholar uh, and Feminist Online. Bella also serves on the editorial collective uh, of the internationally recognized journal Social Text and is uh, the current uh, director of the graduate program in uh, Media Studies at Pratt. So, uh, his, uh, uh, we will be hearing uh, material from his unpublished work, uh, which is entitled. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> the, the book is Computational Capital. Or Computational Capital. Okay. Which so, I'll mention actually. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Antti. Please welcome. Them. Thank you all for being here. I, I really appreciate it, and thank you. Also for inviting me, uh, a special thanks for Titania, Ante, and Diana. I mean, I really appreciate uh, the invitation. I've always really enjoyed being in Zagreb and being with you guys. Um, so uh, I'm, I have a lot to say, uh, and I don't, I've cut it down a lot. Uh, I've asked for a 45-minute um, advisory notice uh, so that I don't bore myself and you all uh, to death, as the last talk suggested. Um, but the the um, the uh, one thing that occurred to me to say uh, after the last talk, uh, two things actually, uh, that my training is actually in literary theory and literary analysis, and um, that's maybe uninteresting except for the fact that you know f part of what um, the, where I come from anyway intellectually is uh, takes as axiomatic that uh, language is fundamentally social. So this uh, <clears throat> this question about sociality uh, and language are are really for me inseparable, and it's something that has informed um, my thinking. Uh, throughout. Um, the other thing is I had to cut a big discussion on humanism here, uh, which uh, I think is still worth talking about, um, partially because it's a, in my view anyway, it's, a, it's an expiring, if not expired, concept. Um, and uh, humanity has um, built its own, uh, its, its, uh, its own identity through uh, the exclusion of um, many, many uh, persons from that, that membership in that rather exclusive club. Uh, so the sort of dialectic of you know dehumanization and humanization is something I've been thinking about and is something that's still active uh, right now. And so the question of whether or not that one can even reclaim the category for me is um, very real, and I'm starting to think that the answer is really uh, no. Uh, in the same in the same way that you know I wouldn't reclaim the category you know America. I mean it's just to, to me that in the United States anyway America means the United States, and it's just an irredeemable um, idea. So um, certain things have their time um, and uh, expire for a variety of reasons, uh, usually for me uh, around s issues of struggle, right? I mean, both the, the struggle uh, to dominate and also the, the struggle to um, throw off uh, the various yokes of domination. Uh, and without sort of going into the ontology of that right now, uh, that's just a very active uh, dialectic in my own <clears throat> thinking. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read mostly. I have a couple of slides which I won't try to um, manage while I'm talking, so I'll just show them to you. Uh, this is my epigram, Statistics is the Science of uh, Distribution from Norbert Wiener. Um, I think a properly Marxist analysis of, of that phrase is in order. I mean, because you know, Marxism is obviously quite concerned with distribution. Um, and so to historicize uh, this idea is, would be one of the projects um, that I'm working on. Uh, these are just some examples of Hollerith uh, punch cards, which I'll be talking about uh, towards the end of the talk, just in case you haven't seen these things. Uh, this was a uh, technology that was invented around um, just before 1900 uh, and um, <clears throat> was used in the census, uh, in various senses around the world. I'll talk about that a little bit. And then it was also used to administer the Holocaust uh, when IBM 
uh, profited tremendously uh, doing that. So um, the relationship between computation and uh, sort of its embedded material history is something I'm very interested in pursuing. Uh, and uh, I think it's one of the major questions that uh, we, we face. Uh, oh yeah, and this is um, Claude Shannon, um, a diagram uh, of about the uh, frequency of uh, letters uh, and, the, and, the, and the sort of occurrence of um, the pathways from one letter to another. I'll have something to say about that. Just keep that uh, image in mind, please. Uh, and this is from uh, Wendy Chun's uh, work on ENIAC um, and the uh, relationship between uh, the mathematician and the operator. Uh, so, so this is, um, as I'll argue, sort of <clears throat> uh, this relationship, which is obviously a gendered uh, relationship, is uh, sedimented into our machines, right? So, I mean, it raises lots of questions about uh, what kind of sovereignty we exercise in relationship to the interface. I think that's all the images, yeah. So, so that's 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 really. I just rather than trying to squeeze them in between paragraphs, I wanted you to see those things uh, beforehand. <clears throat> so I'll start if I can see. Uh, so, hmm. uh, so th this talk is drawn from my current book project, Computational Capital. It understands the rise of capitalism as the first digital culture, with universalizing aspirations and capabilities and recognizes contemporary culture, bound as it is to electronic digital computing as something like digital culture 2.0. Rather than seeing this shift from digital one to digital two strictly as a break, we might consider it as one result of an overall intensification in the practices of quantification. Capitalism, it has been said, <clears throat> was already a digital computer. If capitalism was a digital computer from the get-go, then the invisible hand of Adam Smith as the non-subjective social summation of individualized practices of the pursuit of private, that is quantitative, gain within capitalism is an early expression of the computational unconscious. <clears throat> With the broadening and deepening of the imperative toward quantification and rational calcu calculus posited then presupposed during the early modern period by the expansionist program of capital, the process of the assignation of number to all qualitative variables, that is, the thinking in numbers discernible in the commodity form itself, whereby every use value was also an exchange, an exchange value, entered into our machines. This is one of my main points. The thinking numbers entered into our machines, rendering early on the cargo holds and ship le ledgers of the middle passage, the, the slave ships, right? Uh, then the rationalization of production in the assembly line, and more recently, cameras and modern computing. And it's this legacy I, I want to think about. Today, as could well be known from everyday observation, if not from media theory, computational calculus arguably underpins all productive activity, or nearly all, and particularly significant for this argument, <clears throat> activities that together constitute the command-controlled apparatus of the world system and which stretch from writing to image making and therefore to thought. The contention here is not simply that capitalism is on a continuum with modern computation, but that computation, though characteristic of certain forms of thought, is also the unthought of modern thought. <clears throat> As a domain of the unthought that organizes thought, the computational unconscious is structured like a language, a computer language. The computational unconscious allows us to propose that contemporary consciousness is a computational effect. In short, artificial intelligence. The surprising corollary is that all the structural inequalities endemic to capitalist production, often appearing under the variance of the analog categories of race, class, gender, sexuality, nation, and the necropolitics that all of these imply, are also and is often deposited and thus disappeared into our machines. Put simply, and in deference to uh, contemporary attention spans, including my own, um, our machines are racial formations. They are also technologies of gender and sexuality. In other words, inequality and structural violence inhere in the logistics of computation and consequently in the real-time organization of semiosis, which is to say our practices and our thought. The political analysis of postmodern and indeed post-human inequality must examine the materiality of the computational unconscious. That at least is the hypothesis, for if it is the function of computers to automate thinking and dominant thought is the thought of domination, then what exactly has been automated. Similar to the analysis uh, pursued in the cinematic mode of production, 
the current, the current book project endeavors to defetishize a platform, computation itself, that can only properly be understood when grasped as a means of production embedded in the BIOS. While computation is often thought of as being the thing accomplished by hardware churning through a program, that is the programmatic quantum movements of a discrete state machine, it is important to recognize that the universal Turing machine was and remains media indifferent in theory, and is, th is thus conceived of as an abstract machine. However, it is an abstract machine that, like all abstractions, evolves out of concrete circumstances and practices, which is to say that the universal Turing machine is itself an abstraction subject to historical materialist critique. One might situate the emergence and function of the universal Turing machine as perhaps among the most important ab abstract machines in the last century, save perhaps that of capital itself. However, both their ranking and even their separability is here what we seek to put into question. Without a doubt, computational process, like capital process, has a corrosive effect on ontology, accomplishing a far-reaching liquidation of tradition that includes metaphysical assumptions regarding the intellectual, ontolo ontological character of essence, being, and presence. And we talked a little bit about that in several of the sessions, but you know, Derrida. Um, <clears throat> but Derrida not so only as a deconstructive theory, but as social practice, right? The, the practical deconstruction of, of these things. Um, and without a doubt, computation has been built, even as it has been discovered. The paradigm of computation marks an inflection point in human history that reaches along temporal and spatial axes, both into the future and back into the past, out to the cosmos, and into the subatomic. At any known scale, from Planck time, which is 10 to the negative 44 seconds, to yada seconds, or 10 to the 24 seconds, and from 10 to the negative 35 to 10 to the 27 meters, compute, which is, you know, 60 orders of magnitude, right? Um, uh, comp uh, from those scales, computation, conceptualization, and sense-making sensation have become inseparable. Computation is part of the historicity of the senses. The slight displacement of the ontology of computation implicit in saying that it has been built as much as it has discovered, that computation has a history, even if it now puts history itself at risk, allows us to glimpse, if only from the half-light of the imaginary, that computation is not, so far as we can know, uh, the way of the universe per se, but rather the way of the universe as it has been become intelligible to us vis-a-vis -vis our machines. The understanding from a standpoint recognized as science that computation has fully colonized the knowable cosmos is a humbling insight, significant in that it allows us to propose that seeing the universe as computation, as in short, simulable, if not a simulation, may be no more than the old anthropocentrism now automated by apparatuses. We see what we can see with the senses we have. The universe as it, as it appears to us is figured by, that is, it is a figuration of computation. We build machines that, that discern that the universe functions in accord with their self-same logic. In the new idolatry, it is no wonder the universe is itself currently imagined as a computer. <clears throat> So um, here's the sound of this new theology from a conference sponsored by the Sovereign State of New York University, which, you know, that would be funny in New York because everyone knows that New York, NYU is buying buildings all over the city and all over the world and is now established, putting up its flag in um, different places. And it's really an expansionist uh, project unto itself. Uh, this is from a conference that, <coughs> excuse me, that they sponsored. As computers become progressively faster and more powerful, they've gained the impressive capacity to simu simulate increasingly realistic environments, which raises a question, question familiar to aficionados of the matrix. Might life and the world as we know it be a simulation on a super advanced computer? Digital physicists have developed this idea well beyond the sci-fi possibilities, suggesting a new sci scientific paradigm in which computation is not just a tool for approximating reality, but is also the basis of reality itself. In place of elementary particles, think bits. In place of fundamental laws of physics, think computer algorithms. Science fiction, oh, so that, that's them. <coughs> Excuse me. Science fiction in the form of the matrix is here used to raise the issue of reality itself, right? In place of uh, the fundamental laws of physics, think computer algorithms. But then, quickly dismissed as something science has moved well beyond. However, it would not be illogical here to propose that reality itself is itself science fiction a fiction whose current author is science. Or maybe that's science in quotation marks, I'm not sure. At least if you think about Althusser. Um, it, is no, it is in a way no surprise 
that an MIT physicist, Max Tegmark, claims that consciousness is a state of matter. Consciousness as a phenomenon of information storage and retrieval is a property of matter described by the term computronium. And humans represent a rather low level of complexity of this, uh, of this matter um, for him. Very likely, the math is there to support this cosmic Hegelianism. I have to confess I haven't checked it. Um, I can. Uh, but in the narrative in which the philosopher scientist reveals the working out of the world, or rather cosmic spirit, one might say that it is science fiction, one of the persistent fictions licensed by science that reality itself exists at all. We should emphasize that the trouble here is not so much with reality. The trouble here is with itself. To the extent that we recognize that poesis, or making, has been extended to our machines, and it is through our machines that we think and perceive, we may recognize that reality is itself a product of their operations. Reality itself is thus a simulation, as are we, a conclusion that concurs with the notion of a computational universe, but seems to elide the immediate history of its emergence. In brief, the total enclosure by computation of observer and observed is either reality itself becoming self-aware or tautological, waxing ideological, liquidating as it does historical agency by means of the suddenly a priori stochastic process of cosmic automation. Well, if total automation, then no mistakes. So we may as well take our chances and wager on the negation in the form of a rejection of informatic totalitarianism. I mean, why not? Marx says, consciousness is, from the very beginning, a social product, and remains so for as long as men exist at all. Unquote. This inescapable sociality and history, historicity of knowledge, in short, its political ontology, follows from this. I'm sorry, the escape, inescapable uh, sociality and historicity um, follows from this. At least so long as humans exist at all. We may think computationally, algorithmically, autonomously, or howsoever. But the historically materialized digital infrastructure of the socius thinks in and through us as well. Or, as Marx put it, quote, the real subject remains outside the mind and independent of it. That is to say, so long as the mind adopts a purely speculative, purely theoretical attitude. Hence the subject society must always be envisaged, envisaged as the premises of a conception, even when the theoretical method is employed." Unquote. This subject society, in Marx's terms, is present even in its purported absence. It is, the, it is inextricable from and indeed overdetermines theory and thus thought. In other 20th, first century words, language, narrative, textuality, ideology, digitality, cosmic consciousness. All those things are to be thought in the framework of overdetermination. Uh, this absence structure informs Althusser's Lacanian Marxist analysis of ideology and the ideology of no ideology, uh, which is an analog way of saying uh, that reality is simulation. History as a non-narrative, unsymbolizable absence structure akin to the Lacanian real also informs Jameson's concept of the political unconscious as the black, bo as the black box formal processor of said absence structure, indicated in his work by the term history with a capital H. We will take up Althusser and Jameson in due time, but not here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, for, for now, however, for the purposes of our meteorological investigation, it is important to pursue the thought that precisely this functional overdetermination, which already informed Marx's analysis of the historicity of the senses in the 1844 manuscripts, extends into the development of the senses and the psyche. As Jameson puts it in the political unconscious, quote, that the structure of the psyche is historical and has a history is as difficult for us to grasp as that the senses are not themselves natural organs, but rather the result of a long process of differentiation even within human history, unquote. The evidence for the accuracy of this claim, built from Marx's notion that, quote, the forming of the five senses requires the history of the world down to the present, unquote, has been increasing. There is a host of work on the inseparability of technics and the so-called human, from Mauss to Simondon to Liz and Guattari, Stiegler, that increasingly make it possible to understand and even believe that the human, along with consciousness, the psyche, the senses, and consequently of the unconscious, tra uh, uh, um, are historical formations. My own essay, The Unconscious of the Unconscious, traces Lacan's use of montage, the cut, the gap, the objet, 
photography, and other optical tropes, and argues a bit too insistently, perhaps, I mean, really, it's kind of overstated, um, that, that the unconscious of the unconscious is cinema, and that a scrambling of linguistic function by the intensifying instrumental calculation of ambient images instantiates the presumably organic, but actually equally technical, cinematic black box known as the unconscious. Psychoanalysis is, is the institutionalization of a managerial technique for emergent linguistic dysfunction. Think literary modernism and having to cure it, precipitated by the onslaught of the visible. More recently, and in a way that suggests that the computational aspects of historical materialist critique are not as distant from the Lacanian real as one might think, Lydia Liu's The Freudian Robot shows convincingly that Lacan modeled the theory of the unconscious from inf information theory and cybernetic theory. She combs Lacan's writing for evidence that they are informed by information theory and provides us with some smoking guns, <clears throat> including the following. This is Lacan, quoted in Liu. By itself, the play of the symbol represents and organizes independently of the peculiarities of its human support, this something which is called the subject. The human subject doesn't foment this game. He takes his place in it and plays the rule of the little pluses and minuses in it. That's a binary, right? He himself is an element in the chain which, as soon as it is unwound, organizes itself in accordance with laws. Hence, the subject is always on several levels caught up in the crisscrossing of networks. Unquote. Liu argues that the crisscrossing of networks alludes not so much to linguistic networks, but to communication networks, precisely the information theory that Lacan read, particularly Georges Guilbaud, the author of What is Cybernetics? She says that for Lacan, the primordial couple of this plus and minus, or this game of even and odd, should precede linguistic considerations and is what enables the symbolic order. This is more quotation, uh, it's mixed with Liu and Lacan. You can play heads or tails by yourself, says Lacan. But from the point of view of speech, you aren't playing by yourself. There is already the articulation <clears throat> of three signs comprising a win or a loss. And this articulation prefigures the very meaning of the results. In other words, if there's no question, there's no game. If there's no structure, there's no question. The question is constituted, organized by the structure. Lou comments. The notion of symbolic structure, consistent with game theory, has important bearings on Lacan's paradoxically non-linguistic view of language and the symbolic order. Uh, let us not distract ourselves here with the question of whether or not game theory and statistical analysis represents discovery or invention. Norbert Wiener defines statistics as the science of distribution, and such a statement, as I mentioned at the beginning, calls for a properly Marxist analysis. Indeed, we would want to, to make such an analysis resonate with the analysis of, of logistics undertaken recently by Moton and Harney in the amazing text, The Undercommons, which some of you probably know. Um, and, uh, and following this uh, uh, through logistics uh, to um, the Middle Passage, which for them is the primordial site of logistical uh, thought. Um, for, we mo for the moment, we note that statistics, I can't say that word, historicity, and thus its historical emergence as a socio-symbolic system of organization. Keeping this fact clearly in mind helps us understand that mathematical models quite literally inform the art articulation of the unconscious. Whether logistical, optical, or informatic, the techniques of mathematical concepts, which is to say programs, constitute the unconscious. More elusive still, more, uh, more elusive, perhaps, than the historicity of the unconscious is the notion that the subject society extends into our machines. Willem Flusser tells us, apparatuses were invented to simulate specific thought processes. Only now, following the invention of the computer, and as it were in hindsight, it is becoming clear what kind of thought processes we are dealing with in the case of apparatuses. That is, thinking expressed in numbers. All apparatuses, not just computers, are calculating machines, and in this sense, artificial intelligences, the camera included, even if their inventors were not able to account for this. In all apparatuses, including the camera, thinking in numbers overrides linear historical thinking. <clears throat> this process of thinking in numbers, and indeed the generalized conversion of multiple forms of thought and practice to numeric processing by capital, by apparatuses, by digital computers, requires further investigation. Now that the edifice of computation has achieved a, consolidation, a consolidated sedimentation of human labor, at least equivalent to that required to build a superpower from the ground up, we are in a position to ask 
In what way has capital logic and the logic of private property, which, as Marx points out, is the cause, is, I'm sorry, is not the cause, but the effect of alienated and thus quantified labor, structured computational paradigms? In what way has the subject society unconsciously structured not just thought, but also machine thought? Thinking expressed in numbers, materialized first in commodities, and then in apparatuses capable of automating this thought. Without knowing it, is computation what we've been do up to all along? <clears throat> Flusser suggests as much through his notion that one, the camera is a black box that is a program, and two, that the photograph or technical image produces a magical relation to the world, and as much as people understand the photograph as a window rather than as information organized by concepts. This amounts to the technical image as itself a program for the BIOS, and suggests that the world has been unconsciously organized by computation. As Flusser has it, cameras have organized society in a feedback loop that works towards the perfection of cameras. I mean, Instagram. If the computational processes inherent in photography are themselves an extension of capital logic's universal digitization, then that calculus has been doing its work in the visual reorganization of everyday life for almost two centuries. There's more to say about that, but I can't. <clears throat> Put another way, thinking expressed in numbers, the principles of optics and chemistry, materialized in machines, automates thought as program. The program of, say, the camera functions as a historically produced version of what Catherine Hales has recently called non-conscious cognition. Though locally no more self-aware than the sediment sorting processes of a riverbed, another of Hales's computational examples, the camera nonetheless affects purportedly conscious beings from the domain known as the unconscious, as to give but one shining example feminist theory, film theory clearly shows. Now that so much human time has gone into developing computer hardware and programming, such that hardware and programming are inextricable from the day-to-day, -day, indeed nanosecond to nanosecond organization of life on planet Earth, and not only in the form of cameras, we can ask very pointedly which aspects of computer function, from any to all, can be said to be conditioned by structural inequality? Which computational functions perpetuate it? Structural and now infrastructural inequalities include social injustices, what could be thought of as algorithmic racism, sexism, and homophobia, and also unequal access to many of the things that sustain life and legitimize murder. <laughs> the urgency of such questions is only exacerbated as we recognize that we are obliged to rent or otherwise pay tribute in the form of attention, subscription, student debt to the rentier capitalists of the infrastructure of the algorithm in order to access portions of the general intellect from its proprietors whenever we want to participate in thinking. For it must never be assumed that technology, even the abstract machine, is value neutral, that it merely exists in some uninterested ideal place and is then utilized either for good or for ill by free men. It would be men in such a discourse. Rather, the machine, like Ariel Azoulay's understanding of photography, has a political ontology. It is a social relation and an ongoing one whose meaning is, as Azoulay says of the photograph, never at an end. Now that representation has been subsumed by machines, has become machinic, overcoded, as D&G would say, everything that appears, appears in and through the machine as a machine. For the present, and as Plato already recognized by putting it at the center of the Republic, even the sun is political. Going back to my opening, the cosmos is merely a collection of billions of suns, a near infinite politics. But really, this political ontology of knowledge, machines, consciousness, praxis, should be obvious. How could technology, which of course includes the technologies of knowledge, be anything other than social and historical? How could they be other than the accumulation and objectification of subjectivity that is itself a product? I mean, think about reification. The short answer here is that technology, and thus perception, thought, and knowledge, can only be separated from the social and historical, that is, from what is sometimes called, among other things, racial capitalism, by eliminating both the social and historical uh, society and history through its own operations. While computers might once have, if taken as a separate contingency, along with a few of their biotic avatars, um, and then pressed for an answer, agreed with Margaret Thatcher's view that there is no such thing as society, one would be hard-pressed to claim that this post-sociological discovery is a neutral result. That's Thatcher's observation 
quote, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money, unquote. Admittedly pithy, if condescending and deadly, subordinate social needs to existing property relations and their financial calculus at the ontological level. She smugly panders to the status quo by positing capitalist society as an untranscendable horizon, since the social product is by definition, in capital anyway, always already other people's money. But neoliberalism has required some revisioning of late, which is a play way of saying that fascism has needed some updating. The newish but now firmly established term social media tells us something more about the parasitic relation that the cold calculus, this mathematical universe of numbers has to the bios. To preserve global digital apartheid requires social media, the processing of society itself cybernetically interfaced, interfaced with the logistics of computation. This relation, a means of digital expropriation aimed at an equally significant global aspiration towards planetary communicativity and democratization, has become the preeminent engine of capitalist growth. Society, at first negated by computation and capitalism, is now directly posited as a source of wealth for what is now explicitly computational capital. <clears throat> Attention economy, immaterial labor, neuropower, semi-capitalism. All these terms, despite their differences, um, mean in effect that society as a deterritorialized factory is no longer disappeared as an economic object, only as a beneficiary of the dominant economy. The social revolution in planetary communicativity is being formed, farmed, and, and harvested by computational capitalism. If we want to understand the emergence of computation and of the Anthropocene, we must attend to the transformations and disappearances of life forms, the forms of life in the largest sense. And we must do so in spite of the fact that the sedimentation of, history, of the history of computation would neutralize certain aspects of human aspiration and of humanity, including ultimately even the referent of the latter sign. We have never been, we have never been human. We know this now. The biosynthetic process of computation and human being gives rise to post-humanism only to reveal that there were never any humans here in the first place. Humanity as a protracted example of meconnaissance, as a problem of what could be called the humanizing machine, or per better perhaps, the human machine. Naming the human machine is of course a way of talking about, the con about conquest, about colonialism, slavery, imperialism, and the racializing sex gender norm reinforcing regimes of the last 500 years of capitalism that created the ideological legitimation of its unprecedented violence in the so-called humanistic values it spat out. Amis Césaire said it very clearly when he wrote the scathing question in Discourse and Colonialism, civilization and colonization. The human machine names precisely the mechanics of a humanism that at once resulted from and were deployed by the work of humanizing the planet Earth for the quantitative accountings of capital while at the same time divesting a large part of the planetary population of any of the claims to be human. <clears throat> Humanism was colonial software, and the colonized were the outsourced content providers, the first content providers recruited to support the platform. I have to skip a few things here, sorry. <laughs> the, the long discussion of humanism. <laughs> Here, in the face of the annihilation of remaindered life, to borrow a term from Nefertiti de Ar, by various iterations of techne, we may pose the following question. How are computers and computing an iteration of long-standing historical inequality? Um, yeah, so, that, so that, that, that's, the, that's the question I'm thinking about. And um, I, I have a, a couple of examples. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, is, is anyone like reading about this uh, cultural technique stuff? Is that something that people are talking about here? No? OK, then I won't even bother, because you don't want to. I mean, there, there, there's sort of a, a, of course, it's from Germany, right? But there's this, uh, this kind of neoliberal um, uh, deracinated Marxist feminist thinking, which wants to talk about technology uh, and, and human development sort of uh, being uh, co-evolutionary or co-developmental, but doesn't want to see any of the any of the fundamental antagonisms uh, in that process, right? So you actually can't talk about society in in the ways that people who are invested in the concept would like to talk about it. I mean, in terms of 
colonialism, sexuality, uh, race, gender, and forms of inequality. I mean, obviously, what, part of what I'm working on here is an attempt to um, shift the discourse slightly and reconceptualize things that are already being thought about in a way that makes it possible to create statements which are gener generative in, the, in resolving relations of inequality so they can be conceptualized and become actionable. I mean, I think, you know, this is kind of, <clears throat> this is the interesting burden of theory. Otherwise, it's just a, a way of manufacturing sophisticated forms of complicity. So um, I, I, have a, I have a few examples here. Um, and I, there you are. Uh, I, I have a few examples here, and I'll, um, I'll read them. Um, and uh, we can talk about them in more detail if you want to in a little bit. Um, in 1889, Herman Hollerath patented the punch card system and mechanical tabulator that was used in the 1890 censuses in England, Italy, Germany, Russia, Austria, Canada, uh, Puerto Rico, Norway, France, Cuba, and the Philippines. <coughs> the national census, which normally took eight to 10 years, took a year. Is that 45 minutes? The subsequent invention, <laughs> the, the, the subsequent um, invention of, plug, of the plug board control panel in 1906 allowed for tabulators to perform multiple sorts in whatever sequence was selected without having to rebuild the tabulators from scratch, an early form of programming. Hollerith's tabulating machine company merged with three other companies in 1911 to becoming the computing tabulating and recording company, and which renamed itself uh, famously IBM in 1924. <clears throat> well, the census, <coughs> excuse me, well, the census opens a rich field of inquiry that includes questions of statistics, computing, and state power that are increasingly relevant today. I mean, think about the NSA, right, and what's going on with them. Uh, for now, I, I want, only want to extract two points. One, humans became the fodder for statistical machines. And two, as Vince Raphael has shown regarding the Philippine census, and as Edwin Black has shown with respect to the Holocaust, this technology was inseparable from racialization and genocide. Raphael shows that coupled to photographic techniques, the census at once discerned and imposed a racializing schema that welded historical progress, that's in quotation marks, to ever wider waves of colonization in the Philippines, from Malay migration to Spanish colonization to US imperialism. I mean, this is, this is Hegelian world spirit, right? I mean, this is just sort of like, you know, the, 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 the presencing of world spirit through colonization. Um, and, and Raphael's article uh, in, I think the book is called White Love, is, is really worth, uh, worth reading. On, on, on the Philippine census. Um, also, uh, and for his own part, I mean, Edwin Black's book, I think, is kind of less interesting in some ways, although it's, it's mind-boggling in its own way. Uh, I have a couple quotes from him. Uh, so Edwin Black writes, only after Jews were identified, a massive and complex task that Hitler wanted done immediately, could they be targeted for efficient asset confiscation, ghettoization, deportation, enslaved labor, and ultimately annihilation. It was a cross-tabulation and organizational challenge so monument monumental it called for a computer. I mean, this is where you have this, the idea of um, Deleuze and Guattari that you know, the, the abstract machine precedes the concrete machine. Right? You actually have the social need for something before you invent it. Uh, and I think this is a really important way to see the desire for a computer was sort of part of this, the fascist project. I mean, not only, clearly, but that it uh, has some of its roots here. <clears throat> um, yeah, of course, in the 1930s, no computer existed. But IBM's Hollerith punch card technology did exist. Aided by the company's custom design and constantly updated Hollerith systems, Hitler was able to automate his persecution of the Jews. Uh, historians have always been amazed at the speed and accuracy with which the Nazi Nazis were able to identify and locate European Jewry. Until now, the pieces of this puzzle have never been fully assembled, but then he assembles them in his book. Uh, the fact is, IBM technology was used to organize nearly everything in Germany and then Nazi Europe, from the identification of Jews in the census, registrations and ancestral tracing programs, to the running of railroads and the organizing of concentration camp slave labor. <clears throat> the sorting of populations and individuals by forms of social difference, including race, ability, and sexual difference, Jews, Roma, homosexual people deemed mentally or physically handicapped, for the purposes of sending people who failed to meet uh, certain presumably eugenic criteria off to concentration camps to be dispossessed, humiliated, tortured, and killed, means that some aspects of computer technology uh, themselves emerge from this particular social necessity, often called Nazism. The Philippine-American War, 
in which Americans kill between one-tenth and one-sixth of the population of the Philippines and the Nazi-administered Holocaust are but two world historical events that are part of the meaning of early computational automation. We might say that computers bear the legacy of this type of fascism. It is inscribed in their operating systems. But how? The mechanisms, as well as the social meaning of computation, were refined in its concrete applications. The process of abstraction hid the violence of abstraction even as it integrated the result with economic and political protocols. It is a well-known fact that Claude Shannon's landmark paper towards a mathematical theory of communication proposed a general theory of communication that was content indifferent. This seminal work created a statistical mathematical model of communication while simultaneously consigning any and all specific content to irrelevance as regards the transmission method itself. <clears throat> like use value under the management of the commodity form, the message became only a supplement to the exchange value of the code. Later, in another paper, I will, I will have more to say about the fact that some of the statistical information Shannon derived from about letter frequency in English used as its urtext Jefferson the Virginian. The first volume of Thomas Malone's monu monumental six-volume study of Jefferson, recently in the news for its suppression of information regarding Thomas Jefferson's relation to slavery. So this is the urtext which Shannon uses as the sort of like the fundamental example to derive letter frequency and its supposedly random occurrence in a particular language format. And that's a very interesting fact, I think. <coughs> um, my point here is that the rules for content indifference were themselves derived from a particular content. This deprivileging of the logos as referent was an intensification of the slippage of signifier from signified already noted in linguistics and functionally operative in the elision of slavery in Jefferson's biography, to say nothing of the same text, elision of slave narrative and speech, right? I mean, with the mathematics it looked a little bit different if slave narrative were included or slave discourse was included. Shannon brilliantly and successfully developed a reconceptualization of language as code, sign system, and now is mathematical code, numerical system, that no doubt found its logical con conclusion, at least with respect to metaphysics, in post-structuralist theory and deconstruction, with the placing of the referent under erasure. This recession of the real, of being the subject and experience from codification, allowed Shannon's mathematical abstraction of rules for the transmission of any message whatsoever to become the industry standard, even if, as it also meant, literally, the dehumanization of communication. <clears throat> Tara McPherson has brilliantly argued that the modularity achieved in the development of Unix has its analog in racial segregation. Modularity and encapsulation necessary to the writing of Unix code uh, were, I mean, these were fundamental concepts and still underpin the operating systems we use now. Um, modularity and encapsulation necessary to the writing of Unix code were emergent general socio-technical forms, again, these abstract machines, uh, what here we might call technologies abstract machines or real abstractions. This is McPherson, quote, I am not arguing that programmers creating Unix at Bell Labs and at Berkeley were consciously encoding new modes of racism and racial understanding into digital systems. As she puts it, quote, the reference of emergent, uh, of emergent the, re the emergence of covert racism and its rhetoric of colorblindness are not so much intentional as systemic. Computation is, primary, is a primary delivery method of these new systems, and it seems at best naive to imagine that cultural and computational operating systems don't mutually infect one another, that they're, in fact, fully modular. This is the um, computational unconscious at work. <clears throat> Without a doubt, statistical methods utilized to find Jews in the shtetl are operative in Norbert Wiener's anti-aircraft cybernetics, as well as in Israel, contemporary Israel's Iron Dome. But the prevailing view even if it is not one of pure abstraction, in which computational process has its essence without reference to any concrete whatever, can be found in what follows. As Gabriel Coppola, in an article entitled, Traces of Israel's Iron Dome can be found in tech startups, uh, sh she wrote for uh, Bloomberg News, almost giddily reports, and this is a quotation from the article, the Israeli engineered Iron Dome is a complex tapestry of machinery, software, and computer algorithms capable of intercepting and destroying rockets midair. An offshoot of the missile defense technology can also be used to sell you furniture. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so not. What, what's that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm almost. I'm actually almost done. Um, not, not not only is war a good computer business, it's good for computerized business. Uh, Coppola's article goes on to confess that the latest consumer spin-offs that facilitate the real-time imaging capable of driving sales on the domestic fronts exist thanks to the U U.S. financial support for Zionism and its militarized settler colonialism in Palestine. Quote, 
We have apartheid and genocide to thank for being able to visualize a green, modern couch in our very own living room before we click buy now. Unquote. No, she didn't actually write that, but, but, but she could have. I mean, effectively, that's sort of what the article is saying. You know, thank you, uh, genocide. Thank you, apartheid. You know, we can now shop. <clears throat> Census, statistics, informatics, cryptography, war machines, markets. All management techniques for the organization of otherwise unruly humans and subhumans by capitalist society. The ethos of content indifference in relation to systemic functionality is sustainable only so long as derivative human beings are themselves the content providers, body and soul. And I mean that derivative seriously in the, in the financial sense, uh, where people are sort of cut and rebundled, uh, which gets back to this question of intensity and the financialization of everyday life uh, that we were talking about earlier. <clears throat> but it is not only the tech spin-offs um, from the racist war dividends we should be tracking. Wendy Chun has shown in convincing ways that the gendered history of the development of computer programming, that other image I showed, and ENIAC in which male mathematicians instructed female programmers to physically make the electronic connections and also remove any bugs. I mean, you know about this, right? Computer bugs were actually like the moths that would get stuck in the, in the holes where you plug in the wires. Um, to remove the bugs, echoes in, into the ex present experiences of sovereignty enjoyed by users who have, in many respects, become programmers, even if most of us have, have little or no idea how programming works, or even that we are programming. During World War II, almost all computers, this is John, during World War II, <clears throat> almost all computers were young women, with some background in mathematics. Not only were women available for work, they were also considered to be better, more conscientious computers, presumably because they were better at repetitious clerical tasks. One could say that programming became uh, programming and software became software when commands shifted from commanding a girl to commanding a machine. Chen suggests <coughs> Chen suggests that the argument that the augmentation of our power through the command control functions of computation is a result of what she calls the yes sir of the feminized operator of servile labor. As she puts it, programming begins with yes sir. Indeed, in the ENIAC and other early machines, the execution of the operator's orders was to be carried out by the ren, or the slave. For the desensitized, this information may seem incidental, a mere development or advance beyond the instrumentum vocale, or the, the Roman term for slave, in which uh, even the communicative capacities of the slave are totally subordinated to the master. But here we must struggle to pose the larger question. What are the implications for this gendered and racialized form of power exercised in the interface? What is, <clears throat> what is its relation to gender oppression, to slavery? In this mode of command control over bodies, I'm sorry, is this mode of command control over bodies and extended to the machine a universal form of empowerment, one, which, one to which all post-human bodies might aspire? Or is it a mode of subjectification built in the footprint of domination in such a way that replicates the beliefs, practices, and consequences of prior orders in unconscious but nonetheless deadly ways? Is the computer the realization of the power of a transcendental subject or of, the sub of the, or of the subject whose transcendence was built upon a historically developed version of racial masculinity based upon slavery and gender violence? Norman Wilson Brown's scandalizing film, Workers Leaving the Googleplex, which I might have met, shown a clip from last year, I forget, um, <clears throat> the making of which got him fired from Google, depicts lower class, mostly of color workers, leaving the Google Mountain View campus during off hours. These workers who shared neither the spaces or the perks of the Google white collar workers had different parking lots, entrances, and drove a different class of vehicles. They are the book scanners. Uh, Wilson has also curated and developed a set of images uh, that show the condom clad fingers, black, brown, female, of workers next to partially scanned book pages. He considers these these misscans, because they're, they, they can't go into the Google Books and you access it online, he considers these misscans new forms of documentary evidence. While digitization and computation may seem to have transcended certain humanistic questions, it is imperative that we understand that its, post -human, that its post humanism is also radically untranscendent, grounded as it is on the living legacies of oppression and, in the last instance, on the radical dispossession of billions. <clears throat> Come to Squatter Punk tonight. Uh, these billions are disappeared, literally utilized, as a surface of inscription for everyday transmissions. The dispossessed are the substrate of the codification processes by the sovereign oper operators commanding their screens. The digitized, rewritable screen pixels are just the visible topside, virtualized surface, of bodies dispossessed by capital's digital algorithms on the bottom side, where arguably other metaphysics still pertain. Not Hegel's world, world spirit, 
but rather Marx's imperative towards a ruthless critique of everything existing might begin to explain how and why the current comp computational ecosystem is co-functional with the unprecedented dispossession of racial capitalism and global apartheid. Racial capitalism's programs continue to function on the backs of those consigned to servitude. Data visualization, whether in the form of the selfie, global map, digitized classic, or downloadable sound of the cosmic Big Bang, is powered by this illusion. It is, shall we say, inescapably local to planet Earth, fundamentally historical in relation to species emergence, inexorably complicit with the deferral of justice. The global south, with its now worldwide distribution, <clears throat> is endemic to the geopolitics of computational capital. It is one of its extraordinary products. The computronics that organize the flow of capital through its materials and signs also organize the consciousness of capital. The computational unconscious names the aspect of global function that still require analysis. Thus we, need, th thus we sneak up on the two principal meanings of the concept of com computational unconscious. On the one hand, we have the problematic residue of amortized consciousness, I take that from Goo, and the praxis thereof that has gone into the making of contemporary infrastructure, meaning to say the structural repression and forgetting that is endemic to the very essence of our technologies. On the other hand, we have the organization of everyday life taking place on the basis of this amortization, that is, on the basis of a dehistoricized, deracinated relation to both concrete and abstract machines that function by virtue of the fact that history has been shorn off them and its legibility purged from their operating systems. <clears throat> Put simply, we have forgetting, the dis disappearance from memory of the historical conditions of possibility of what is. As a consequence, we have the organization of social practice and futurity, or the lack thereof, on the basis of this absence. Never has it been truer that memory requires forgetting. The exponential growth in, the memory, in memory storage means also an exponential growth in systematic forgetting. <clears throat> As a thought experiment, one might imagine a vast and empty vestibule, a James and Gofried ho global holocaust memorial of unprecedented scale covering all oceans and all lands, dedicated to all the forgotten names of the colonized, the encamped, the staticized, the read, written, and rendered in the history of computational calculus, of computer memory. These two, and the Anthrop Anthropocene itself, are the sedimented, sedimented remains that constitute the computational unconscious. So, stop there.